I was alone in a room 100,000 miles from Earth. My body lay dead before me, and yet I spoke and felt and lived. Behind me lay a tortured world. Before me, the moon and destiny. Again, I felt the surge of power, and had I been able to, I would have smiled. My mission was accomplished. No one knew, no one understood. If they had, they would not believe. This was a project 3,000 years old, yet no one had guessed. No one. Listen now to 2,000 Plus. Adventures into the world of tomorrow. Science fiction stories from the years beyond 2000 A.D. Today, a story entitled The Flying Saucers. It is the year 2000 plus 12. A blazing New Mexico sun shines down upon a great military installation, upon a vast, noisy field, and upon a silvery shape which seems to strain forward, ready to leap up into space. In an executive office, a man sits in his chair, his eyes on the great rocket. Behind him, a girl waits for him to speak. Better close that window, Eileen. The noise won't let a man think. Yes, sir. Ah, that's better. I'm ready, Dr. Bronson. Get this on tape as well as in shorthand. It's for the permanent files in Washington. It's got to go out in the next jet. I'll give you a signed sheet of stationery. Send it off to make the five o'clock connection. You got that? Yes, sir. Recorder on. The letter to be transcribed over your signature and sent off on the five o'clock connecting plane. Right. Heading. Top secret. Two, National Scientific Council. Copies to Joint Chiefs of Staff, Secretary of Defense, the President. From Andrew Bronson. Forget the usual string of titles, Eileen. Chief Department of Extraterrestrial Research, White Sands, New Mexico. Regarding defense measures against aerial visitors listed in file AA-286 as flying saucers. One. For the past three months, this secret experimental installation has been visited by flying saucers. First appearance coincided with the launching of our secret flying missile, Zeus. Details in report CB-286, A, B, and C. Two, although the flying saucers have never landed, the frequency of their visits has tripled since the launching. As reported in the files cited, Zeus has not yet returned. Three, in view of the importance to national security of this secret installation and its experiments, the reports already mentioned were reviewed by JCS and the National Scientific Council. It was decided that the flying saucers were a potential menace and that countermeasures be undertaken. Four, Zeus II, an improved model of our secret flying missile, has been completed and armed. It is equipped with mass attraction and proximity fuse devices. Warhead contains 5,000 pounds hexanite. Firing control automatic. C file CB-344. Five. The station has been placed in condition alert. Next visit from the flying saucers is expected momentarily. In view of the foregoing, we are in complete readiness. 
We will attack. Repeat. We will attack. Ah, now where's my pen? Andrew. Ah, this one doesn't work. Oh, I'll get it. I saw your pen in your vest. Don't touch that vest. I, uh, I'll get it myself. Did I do something wrong? No, no, no. There, uh, well, you might have been hurt. Hurt? No, oh, never mind. There you are, my signature. Now, on your way. Andrew, why can't I stay? You know the orders, Eileen. We're going to test Zeus, too. You know anything can happen. Maybe the flying saucers will come back. If they do, we'll be ready for them. Besides, if the rudder should go wrong or the hexanite detonate... No, no, no. On your way now. The jet car's waiting downstairs. Oh. Very well. But you will be careful, won't you? Of course. Uh, Eileen. Yes? I've never told you... Yes? Never mind. Au revoir, my dear. Au revoir, my darling. Dr. Bronson to security. Come in, security. Security, aye. Has Miss Harkness phoned in yet? No, sir. Well, that's funny. I expected it to after sending off the latest reports. She should be home now. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Well, something must have happened to us. Send a security officer to check. Uh, what about the setup for the new test? All ready, sir. Oh, that's good. I hope nothing happens. Uh, a- any report of flying saucers? No, sir, not yet. But, sir, there's something funny about that. Every time we get ready for a test, even one of the minor missiles, one of the saucers appears. That's too much of a coincidence for comfort, sir. Yes, I thought of that, too. You think there's a leak somewhere? Yes, we've checked and rechecked. Nothing. But there's no doubt that someone's passing out information. I see. Of course, we'll keep on checking. Whoever is responsible... Dr. Dr. Bronson. Radar control to Dr. Bronson. Bronson here. What is it? Flying saucer detected and registered. Computation center fed data. Data follows. Distance, 486 miles. Height, 50.2 miles. Speed, 5 miles per second. Estimated time of arrival at contact point, 1 minute, 58 seconds from now. 158. Right. Uh, alert fire control. Fire control alerted, sir. But when may we expect you? In 30 seconds. Over and off. Are you still on security? Aye, sir. Clear the field. Field already cleared. I've just sent emergency red signal. We're waiting in control, sir. Very well. I'm coming down right now. Over and off. Headset and hand mic, Scotty. Yes, sir. Thank you. Bronson to fire control. Fire control to Bronson. Everything ready here, Chief. Dolly's cleared from Zeus to warhead arm. Well done. Bronson to computation. Computation. Your figures checked through cybernetics? Yes, sir. As reported, Zeus 2 should destroy flying saucers six seconds after blastoff. Firing time, 2200, 33 hours, 36 seconds. Time check, everyone. Time is now... 32 seconds to blast off. Condition red. I shall operate fire control remote. Strap in for firing. Security. Security, aye. Report. Field cleared, guards alerted and shielded. Anti-radiation up, warhead armed. Zeus 2 ready. Any further... 10 seconds. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2... One fire. Get a bearing on that trajectory computation. Trajectory established and being fed Mac. Trajectory correct, sir. Parabolic sound reflectors receiving. Contact, 2233-42, right on an ocean. <laughs> Good work, everyone. 
Security. Security, hi. Condition green. Well, boys, now to wait till someone phones in where the pieces fell. And then maybe we'll be finally knowing what the flying saucers are. Has security located Eileen Harkness? No, sir, not yet. Uh, Cap McDonald is here, sir. He has a man with him, says you should see him immediately. Ah, uh, well, all right, bring him in. Yes, what is it? Uh, McDonald thought you'd like to hear this, sir. This is Al Waters, a rancher from upstate. He flew down from his ranch this morning and reported to the state police. They sent him to us. The saucer? Yes, sir. Where is it, Mr. Waters, the, uh, the wreck? Wreck? I didn't see no wreck, Doc. What did you see? I seen a flying saucer come down about half a mile from my ranch house. Saw it this morning when I was going after a lost calf. He swears the saucer's undamaged, Dr. Bronson. Huh. Well, it may not be the one we... You, uh, flew down, Mr. Waters? Yep, yeah, got my own jet plane. Well, uh, can you take me up with you? Uh, to your ranch, I mean. Sure can. I'm glad to. All right, we'll leave immediately. Uh, Scotty, you round up the crew, everyone. Have them load everything we need on the transport, the big job. Uh, when can I expect you? Oh, uh, give us two hours, sir. All right. Now, Mr. Waters, let's get to your ranch. There's the flying saucer, Doc. Where? You see them two peaks? Uh, that plateau between them, you see it? There, now the sun's hit it. It is undamaged. I'm putting her down. Did you see any signs of life? Anything moving? No, sir. Of course, I didn't get too close. I was might leery the thing. I understand. It's just as well you didn't. Hey, hey wait till she stopped rolling, Doc. Sure are excited, ain't you? I'm afraid so. Even scientists get excited sometimes. Sure is big, ain't she? Yes, must be over 300 feet in diameter. Now, there's an airlock. Hey, you ain't going in. Was that uh, round door open when you first saw this? I don't know. I don't remember. If you're going in, Doc, I'm going with you. Well, thank you. It'll be safer. There's two of us. You got a gun? Uh, no. I'm glad I got mine, then. Never can tell what you'll bump into. Hey, don't you think you ought to wait for the rest of your gang? I, I can't. I've got to see what's in there. Okay. Watch your head. Right. The inner door is still closed. Let's hope it'll open. Oh, that will. Look at that. Sure looks complicated, don't it? This must be the control room. I can't wait to inspect Ain't that it. another door over there? Yes. You'd better stay here. Don't touch anything. I'll see if there's anyone still aboard. Okay, Doctor. Keep your eyes open. A larger room. This must be the crew's quarters. There's no one here. Let's... What's that? I felt giddy for a second. Well, I'll take a look through it. Eileen. Eileen, wake up. Wake up. Unconscious. Eileen. Still unconscious. How did she get here? I've got to get doctor. What, what is... What, what are you doing at that control board? If uh, you look through the porthole, Dr. Bronson, you'll notice that we're miles up and still accelerating. We would have been higher if I hadn't to take such care with my takeoff. What is you crazy? Who are you? What are you taking me? Us. You were right when you guessed that this is not the saucer you destroyed. It isn't. You were wrong when you said there was no crew on board. There is. You see, I am the crew. You should consider yourself very fortunate, Dr. Bronson. It's not everyone who can view the Earth from a distance of a hundred thousand miles. You can put that gun away. Let me take care of Miss Harkness. 
I've already assured you there's nothing wrong with her. Merely an advanced soporific. She'll recover quickly. In fact, here she is now. Andrew. Eileen, stay where you are. He has a gun. Where, where are we? How did I get here? I think you'd better sit down, Miss Harkness. Who, who's he? I don't know. He calls himself Waters. Where are we? I, I looked out of a porthole. Oh, don't be frightened, Eileen. We're, we're on a flying saucer. A flying saucer? Yes. How did you get here? I... I don't know. I... I sent off the report, got into the car, and woke up here. <laughs> One of my operatives. I shall now engage the automatic controls, and the ship will fly itself until we get to the moon. The moon? Yes, that is our first stop. You see, fast as this saucer is, it would take us centuries to get to our ultimate destination... So we must transfer to a matter converter at our base on the moon, and we shall be in core almost instantly. In core? What are you talking about? Perhaps a little explanation is due you. We core are the inhabitants of the solar system you know as Rigel. But that's 500 light years away. Exactly. Although the speed of what you Earthmen have been pleased to call our flying saucers is approximately that of light, even that speed would entail a round trip of a thousand years. True, the core are almost immortal, but for efficiency's sake, we set up a matter converter to flash us, or uh, rather, I should say, our operatives, through space, instantaneously. Our base is on the dark side of the moon. From there, we transship to the saucers. But why? Why are you so interested in Earth? Why haven't you let us know, sent representatives to the World Council. One thing at a time, Dr. Brodson. I see you partake of your pulp writer's suspicions that we intend to take over the Earth. The truth is just the opposite. We want Earth left strictly alone for our research. How can we believe that? The truth is self-explanatory. We've been visiting the Earth for over 3,000 years. 3,000 years? Yes, Miss Harkness. But Why? For what reason? A very simple reason. Our interests differ from yours. Without research, we become bored. To spend eternity in boredom. Well, we are primarily psychologists. Social psychologists. While you are engrossed in a mechanical civilization. Of course, we fostered that development. I still don't understand it. I didn't expect you to. However, in every society, there are certain problems, shall I say, which can only be solved experimentally. We have used you humans in our experiments. It's been extremely interesting. You mean you've been using us as guinea pigs, as, 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 as experimental animals? You may put it that way if you wish. I still don't see how. Through our operatives. That's the third time you've mentioned operatives. What do you mean? We, core possess no body as you know it. We are constructed of energy. In order for us to visit Earth, it was necessary for us to construct human bodies and to inhabit them. We thereupon had an operative who could go to work on Earth. You couldn't have gotten away with it. Someone must have suspected well, you. Exactly. There were a few suspicions. So we took the memory of life on core away from our operatives and landed them on Earth, complete with an Earth history. Uh, you may remember Alexander. Alexander the Great. He was one of our operatives. And François Villon, uh, his task was to satirize his time and to lead the unrest which brought on the French Revolution. There we had another, Marat. Villon, Marat. It's incredible. Not at all. As one of your Earthmen, Emerson, said, an institution is the length and shadow of one man. We saw to it that the key men in each age were ours, our operatives. The problems they set Earth gave our scientists much material to work with. Enough for another few thousand years. Then our inventions, our our scientific advances were were pushed on by you. Yes, like giving an ape, ape a stick to see what he will do with it. Then our wars, our revolutions? Naturally, wars and revolutions are part of the research. They're all part of the master plan. Uh, but don't forget, we fostered genius, too. Why are you telling us all this? Surely that must be clear even to you. You are perhaps the leading scientist in America, certainly the leading figure in the use of atomic power for extraterrestrial research, a key man. But 
Doesn't that suggest something to you? No. I can't believe it. Certainly, my dear Bronson. You are one of our operatives. You've done your work. But your experiments have endangered our base on the moon. So it's time to transport you back to core. Mm. Ah, the signal. Mm. We are approaching our base. Mm. Uh, it will be a comfort to leave mm. this unpleasant body and to resume mm. my right... Bronson, put down that hand. Here, here, put this handkerchief over your nose, Eileen. The gas will clear away in a moment. Ah, I think it's all right now. The full force was directed at this, this core. Oh, what, what was it? I had a gas pen in my vest, an idea which was originated after some of our scientists were kidnapped by the Eastern Alliance. I never thought I'd have to use it on, on something like this. Is he? Is he dead? No, no. He's merely unconscious for a few minutes. The gas is harmless. See if you can find something to put around his hands and feet while I see if I can operate the controls. We've got to get back to Earth. All right, Andrew. They won't believe our story, but they'll have to believe this ship. Uh, I can't find anything to use. You'd better hurry. All right. I... <gasps> Andrew. What is it? We haven't much time. I thought you said the gas was harmless. Of course it is. But this man isn't unconscious. He's dead. Dead? There's no pulse, no breathing, no heartbeat. Oh, Andrew. Now get hold of yourself. I don't know how to... If it was his life or ours, Eileen. I... I neglected to inform you that a core of the upper grades can leave his body as he pleases. <coughs> I see that I underestimated you, Dr. Bronson. You saw immediately that my weakest point was the human body of which I complained. Very clever. Ah. I, I, I can't move. I need no futile arms and hands in this form. A core carries power, for a core is power. I, I take it you will rid us of our bodies, too. Precisely. Isn't there anything... If we promise to forget, you, you can make us forget. Unfortunately, the matter is out of my hands. My orders were to recall two operatives. Two? Yes. Miss Harkness was a psychometrist in her previous, uh, shall I call it, uh, incarnation. An excellent one, too, Draga. Uh, or Eileen, as you're now called. But, but this is inhuman. Precisely. I am not human. Let Eileen go. I, I, I'll i go with you gladly, but I'll leave No, you. Andrew. Take me instead. The answer is the same for both of you. No. What kind of fiends are you? Isn't there one of you with pity? Just one who knows what we feel, who, who, who's felt the agony of the millions you've made your guinea pigs? You're speaking of sympathy? No. Uh, ah, yes, yes, I stand corrected. There was one, of course, who felt that strange emotion. Carter. An odd being, as I recall. And I suppose you killed him. No. A core being energy cannot be destroyed. We captured Carter and exiled him to your planet. An enormous task. He was one of our greatest scientists. That makes it all the more strange, you see. He wished to stop our experiment. <laughs> well, we lost track of him, but no matter. The unfit must go. That is the paramount law of nature. Enough of these digressions. It is time. At least we... let me say goodbye. A little time must elapse before I can build up the energy to free you of your body. You may have the time. Besides, it is a new experience to me. Most interesting. Eileen, darling. It's too late now, but I want you to know I love you. I've loved you ever since you walked into my office three years ago. And I love you, Andrew. I always have. I always will. A very touching. Don't be afraid. My darling. This touching of lip to lip... Very interesting. Energy is undoubtedly transmitted. Uh, very well, Dr. Bronson. It is time. No, take me first. Let him go. <gasps> Andrew. Your emotion is senseless. I'm merely returning the two of you to your true being. Oh, Andrew. My darling. My darling. So this is your odd emotion called love? This should make an interesting report. A minor report, it is true, but... You have done your work, 
Oh, Loka, you have done your work too well. You... You are not the operative I was sent for? No. I am Carter, at last. But now, with two centuries of power, power I learned on Earth, there is no core who can withstand me now. <laughs> Sympathy is the ability to feel what others feel. How do you feel now, Loka? I don't understand. Unscientific. Unscientific. No. Say mercy. Say it. Unscientific. Mercy. Mercy. There shall be changes on Korm. We must leave Earth alone to work out its destiny in its own way. Now, go to the converter and await me there. Draga. My Eileen. Android. Don't be afraid. The transition is painless. There is so much for us to do on course, so much to teach them. Oh, Andrew, I, I can't. I, I'm so frightened. Don't be. Your power will soon be with me. For you, too, are core. What those fools didn't know was that emotion, too, is power. With your love and mine, we can right the wrongs core has done to Earth. There is eternity for both of us to spend together. Eileen. Draga. Come. I, I'm ready. My darling. Now. And forever. <laughs> Next week on 2000 Plus, another dramatic story of unbelievable adventure. The story of a world of the past locked in the world of tomorrow. Time out of hand. Be sure to listen. 2000 Plus is produced and directed by Dreyer and Olson Productions Incorporated. In today's production, Ralph Bell portrayed Dr. Bronson, Louis Van Ruten was Waters, Brian Rayburn was Eileen, Ken Williams was Scotty. The script was written by Pierre Gerson. The orchestra was conducted by Emerson Buckley, music composed by Elliot Jacoby, sound Walt Shaver and Adrian Penner, engineer Martin Enghauser. This is Ken Marvin speaking. 